the weight finally lifted. Starting today, my parents would be moving in with me. It felt surreal, a stark contrast to the scene just a few months ago. I could still vividly recall standing on the rubble of our family home, Scott's words echoing in my ears. Hurry up and bring the inheritance here. My laughter had been involuntary, a nervous reaction to the absurdity of the situation. What are you talking about? Have you lost your mind? I'd asked, bewildered. Scott and my in-laws stared at me, their faces etched with confusion. That's when I laid it all out for them. My name is Amy Jackson. I was born the eldest daughter of ordinary, hard-working parents. My brother and I grew up in a typical, loving family. At 30, I married Scott, and we built a life together, raising two wonderful children, Eric and Judy. By 52, our kids were grown, forging their own paths. It was time for Scott and me to relax, to enjoy the fruits of our labor. It was an ordinary life, but it was mine, and I was content. Then, winter arrived, bringing with it a devastating blow. My father was in a car accident, gone in an instant at the age of 68. Grief engulfed our family, but it was my mother who bore the brunt of it. She retreated into herself, refusing to eat, her eyes clouded with a profound sadness. Mom, I know it's hard, but you have to eat, I pleaded, my heart breaking at her despair. I know, she'd whisper, her voice barely audible, but I just don't have the appetite. It feels like there's a stone lodged in my chest. My brother and I attributed her loss of appetite to grief, but within weeks she had withered away. Fear propelled me to take her to the hospital where the doctor delivered a crushing diagnosis. Cancer. Advanced. Inoperable. She had about a year left. The pain of losing my father was still raw, and now this. I hadn't had the chance to truly care for my parents, and now my mother was facing her own mortality. I was devastated, but I couldn't succumb to grief. My brother lived far away, leaving me to shoulder the responsibility of caring for my mother. I told Scott that I wanted to bring her to live with us. I couldn't bear the thought of her facing this alone, both emotionally and physically. His reaction was not what I expected. We just finished dealing with your dad's funeral, and now I have to be dragged into more of your family's issues? He sighed, his annoyance evident. You don't have to say it like that, I pleaded. Could you just drive her to the hospital and back? Do we really have to live with her? I think she might feel lonely, I added, hoping to appeal to his empathy. If it's not okay, maybe I can just stay at my family home for a while. Scott's indignation flared. Who's going to take care of my meals while you're gone? He demanded. I'll come and cook, of course, I offered. What about cleaning? Who's going to do the laundry? He pressed his tone accusatory. I fell silent. I intended to do what I could, but I couldn't do everything as before. His words stung, highlighting the reality of the situation. If someone had accused me of being selfish for wanting to care for my mother, I wouldn't have been able to argue. I knew my mother, ever considerate, would say everything was fine, but I desperately wanted to do something for her, for my parents. Finally, Scott relented, his voice grudging. Fine. But I'm not helping with anything, you hear? His attitude was arrogant, but he had agreed. Sorry, and thank you, I murmured, a mix of gratitude and resentment swirling within me. Despite his awful behavior, he had granted my wish. I swallowed my frustration and thanked Scott, even though his words stung. Despite the inconvenience, we moved into my family home, leaving behind the company housing we'd shared. Scott, being an only child, had always planned to live with his parents eventually. The company housing had been convenient for work, and the rent was minimal, but now we had more space and saved on rent. Living together wasn't entirely unpleasant for Scott, though he remained true to his word and refused to lift a finger to help. I was grateful for the opportunity to care for my mother. Despite her energy, she often felt weak and spent much of the day resting. I prepared her meals, fed her, and managed her medication. It would have been impossible for her to manage alone. I'm sorry, Amy. Thank you, she'd say, her voice weak but filled with gratitude. It's a big help that you're here with me. Scott, too, I should think. She was oblivious to Scott's harsh words, extending her thanks to him as well. One evening, after my mother had retired for the night and Scott returned home, 
I tried to discuss her treatment over dinner. He glared at me, his face hardening. I don't know what you want me to say, he snapped. I told you I'm not helping with anything. He refused even to listen. I desperately needed someone to vent to, someone to share the burden with. All I wanted was for Scott to listen. But even after two months, three months, his attitude remained unchanged. He constantly complained about living together, acting as if he were doing me a favor. His behavior grew increasingly toxic with each passing day. I couldn't confront him, though. Caught between worrying about my mother and trying to appease Scott, I was becoming increasingly stressed. Around the two-year mark, my mother's condition deteriorated rapidly. She was hospitalized and passed away five days later. Despite my mental preparation, grief washed over me. My brother's family and my children rushed to my side, offering invaluable support. In times like these, you crave your spouse's presence. But Scott was laughing and chatting with his parents in a corner, completely detached from the funeral preparations. My brother took charge, and somehow we managed to arrange everything. But Scott, who should have been seated in the family section, was at the very back, among the distant relatives. Scott, I want you to sit in the family section, I said, my voice trembling. No, I'm fine here, he replied dismissively. I'm not a blood relative after all. But you're my husband, I pleaded. His mother chimed in, her voice laced with disapproval. He's your husband, but he's not your mother's son. Scott is our son, so he's an outsider, you know. Hearing this from my in-laws was excruciating. I was speechless. In my upbringing, it was customary for sons-in-law to sit in the family section at funerals, though customs might vary. With Scott refusing to join the family section, whispers started among the distant relatives. They wondered if we had divorced. It was one thing for people to gossip, but all this could have been avoided if Scott had simply taken his place. Despite the pain of his absence, we managed to bid farewell to my mother peacefully. After the funeral, my brother's family, my children, Scott, and his parents returned to my family home. Thank you for coming, especially at such a busy time, I said to my in-laws offering them tea. Their laughter was jarring. Really, it's something, they replied. First your father, now your mother. These funeral expenses are a burden for us too, but at least that's the end of it. I was stunned. What did they mean by that? Their callous words were a slap in the face. I forced a smile and excused myself, needing a moment to process their insensitivity. As I retreated, I overheard Scott talking with his parents. It must have been tough for you, Scott, living with outsiders, his father said. Yeah, dealing with Amy's whims was a pain, Scott replied. A husband shouldn't just follow his wife's demands. If you don't like something, you have every right to refuse. My fists clenched. Their laughter grated on my nerves. But this wasn't new. Scott's parents had always been insensitive and rude. When Scott and I got married, his mother had remarked, Couldn't you find someone more attractive? I can't expect much for grandchildren. His father had joked, They say beauty gets boring after three days. With Amy, you won't get bored. Scott had just laughed along. Reflecting back, neither Scott nor his parents had offered a single comforting word to me, either at my father's funeral or after my mother's passing. Instead, they had ridiculed me. I had felt sorry for imposing on Scott, but now I questioned his character. I had been too concerned about Scott while simply wanting to do right by my mother. I realized I shouldn't have felt so guilty towards Scott, especially since he wasn't supportive. While I simmered in anger, Scott and his parents continued to laugh and chat in another room. If my brother's family and my kids had heard them, they would have been upset, but fortunately they were in the kitchen. I was relieved to be the only one who heard Scott and his parents' conversation. Then my mother-in-law spoke up. Amy, she called. Yes, I replied, startled. Can I have this? she asked, holding my mother's purse. Confused, I stammered, oh, well... Your mother won't be needing it anymore, right? She said, her tone laced with a disturbing lack of empathy. Scott suggested I take it home. Maybe I'll just keep it, she added, holding up the purse and inspecting it. I couldn't believe her audacity, especially right after the funeral. I took the purse from her and said firmly, No, you can't. 
Her expression changed, not because of the purse, but because I, her daughter-in-law, stood up to her. Yet I stood my ground. We're not ready to sort through my mother's belongings yet. We'll distribute her keepsakes among the family later. My mother-in-law turned red with anger. What do you mean? Are you saying I'm an outsider? She spat. You said earlier at the funeral that even Scott was an outsider to my mother. How come Scott is an outsider but your family isn't? Hearing this, Scott and his father also turned red. What are you saying? Scott demanded. Apologize to mom. How disrespectful of a daughter-in-law to talk like that. Their commotion drew everyone from the other room. I hadn't expected to be called an outsider after all the effort we put into attending the funeral. Let's go home, Dad, my mother-in-law shouted at me in front of everyone and stormed out of our house. For some reason, even Scott was angry and left with his parents. What happened? Did you really call your mother-in-law an outsider? Everyone asked me, their faces etched with confusion and concern. Having heard only my mother-in-law's side of the story, it might have seemed like I was the one being harsh. But I explained the situation to everyone, and not a single person blamed me. Grandpa and Grandma should be more considerate of other people's feelings, my children said. That's just how Dad, Grandma, and Grandpa have always been. My children sided with me, but I still couldn't forgive those three. Scott hadn't come home since that day, and I hadn't contacted him either. I didn't think I should be the one to apologize, and I wasn't sure if I could forgive him even if he did. But I knew things couldn't stay this way forever. Then one day, Scott came back. Welcome home. I greeted him, suppressing the anger that flared up at the sight of him. It's been tough, huh? His gruff words were an attempt at showing concern, and I was taken aback. Take the kids and go on a trip. It'll be a good change of scenery for you, he said, handing me travel vouchers. I was speechless. Instead, tears started to stream down my face. It might have been the kids' idea, but I was touched that Scott went along with it. I immediately contacted the kids to plan the trip. Really, Dad suggested this. It's surprising, isn't it? The kids were astonished by my proposal. It seemed like it really was a gift from Scott. I wonder if Dad feels bad about what happened, I said, laughing. I gratefully accepted the travel vouchers from Scott. I'll be gone for a while. Yeah, take your time. Stay with the kids at their places, too. Why not? Really, I can't be away that long. Don't worry about me. I'll relax at my parents. Just enjoy yourselves. With that, Scott sent me off. Judy was happy to have me visit. So before the spa trip, I stopped by her place and then Gary's. I hadn't been able to visit them while caring for my mother, so I helped out by cooking and freezing meals for them. Mom, you should relax, but thanks. This really helps, they both said, delighted to have my cooking at home. This opportunity was all thanks to Scott's suggestion. Then came the eagerly awaited spa trip. I spent a relaxing time at the hot springs with my children. The weariness from caregiving and the sorrow of losing my parents seemed to have healed quite a bit. I was away for almost a week, but both my kids returned to their homes with bright smiles. That was fun. We should thank Dad for once, Judy said. True, just this once, but I wonder if he's up to something, she joked. Don't say that. Dad thought about us in his own way, I laughed. I returned home planning to share the memories with Scott and start our life anew as a couple. But I was speechless. What? The house is... I looked around in disbelief. Despite recognizing the location, the family home that should have been there was gone. Then, out of nowhere, Scott appeared, followed by his parents. They were grinning at me, standing there, dumbfounded. Scott, what's going on? I asked. With the same sickening smile, Scott said, Finally, I'm rid of that baggage. Starting today, my parents are moving in with me at my house. What are you talking about? I replied, trying to stay calm. Have you lost your mind? Your family home has been demolished. Bring the inheritance to our place quickly. Whatever you inherited, it's Scott's now. I realized then that the disappearance of the house was Scott's doing, and it was all for the inheritance. Such betrayal after thinking about the future on my way home. I was filled with indescribable sadness and anger, but demolishing the house wouldn't go Scott's way. I won't let it go. I burst into laughter at the sight of their smirking faces. My laughter baffled Scott and his father. Why are you laughing? What a weird woman. Has she gone crazy? My mother-in-law said, 
looking at me as if I were eerie. Facing the three of them, I spoke up. Don't you guys know what you're talking about? I haven't inherited a single penny, so there's no inheritance. After saying that, I burst into laughter again. They had mistakenly thought they'd become rich from the inheritance. Their wild imaginations and actions had me in uncontrollable laughter. What do you mean? Explain yourself, Scott demanded. But I kept my mouth shut. I felt no need to enlighten them. Ignoring Scott's question and rejecting his suggestion made my mother-in-law furious. You helped with your parents' housework, but you can't do ours? You're aware of the circumstances, right? I agreed to live together, didn't I? She yelled. I told you I didn't want to live together. Have you forgotten that? You chose to live together to avoid housework. I refuted them one after another. Also, demolishing the family home like that, VJ, there are things you just shouldn't do. I yelled at them before leaving. Behind me, Scott's voice called out, Where are you going? But I didn't look back. Right now, I needed to find a place to sleep for the night, and I really didn't want to see Scott's face. I immediately consulted a lawyer. Demolishing a house couldn't be that easy. The house was still in my mother's name. As I wondered which company had done it, an unbelievable truth came to light. Scott and his father had demolished it themselves. His father, who worked in demolition, enlisted the help of acquaintances and even rented heavy machinery. The planning was meticulous. Moreover, they even gave me travel vouchers to get rid of me. Tears welled up in my eyes at the realization of being deceived. The frustration was unbearable. Is there any way to punish all three of them? I asked the lawyer, tears streaming down my face. The lawyer smiled at me kindly. Scott unlawfully demolished the house in your mother's name. He could be charged with property destruction and held liable for damages. Let's start by demanding a formal apology from Scott. I nodded in agreement, and the lawyer quickly took the necessary actions. A few days later, Scott called me, furious about the legal notice he received. What's with this certified letter? He yelled. Oh, you got it. You destroyed my precious house. So, of course, you have to compensate, I replied. Compensate? We said we were moving to my parents' place. I demolished a house that nobody was going to live in. You should be thanking me, not asking for compensation. Now bring the inheritance and come back home, he said arrogantly. Thank you for demolishing my house. Don't make me laugh. And what inheritance? It's not even settled yet, I shouted back. Scott was silent, seemingly taken aback by my anger, which I rarely displayed. The reason I laughed when the house was demolished was exactly this. I had a whole year with my mother. It was obvious that we would discuss matters of inheritance. So I told my brother I didn't want anything and to give it all to him. As a result, he inherited all the cash and stocks. He insisted that I should have the house since he lived far away and couldn't manage it. If I wasn't going to live there, it could be rented out. That was the plan. Either you and your father restore the house to its original state or pay the amount specified in the letter, I stated firmly. I was hoping to settle this amicably. My voice trembled with barely suppressed fury. Well, fine. If you can't pay, I'll file a police report and sue you. I'm sorry, Scott stammered, already backpedaling. I didn't think you'd get so angry. Of course I'm angry, I snapped, my voice laced with hurt and betrayal. What did you expect? Scott had always been manipulative, and this time was no different. He'd convinced himself that if my family home was gone, he wouldn't have to live with his parents. His father had always harbored a dream of the whole family living together, and he'd developed a fondness for Eric. Scott had refused before, citing long commutes, but his parents had believed me to be the obstacle. So, he'd demolished my house, making it seem like I was the one who'd agreed to move in with them using the inheritance money. But I couldn't forgive him for this. Please give me a break, Scott pleaded. I didn't mean any harm. Dad's sorry, too. If he's truly sorry, I said, my voice cold, then agree to the settlement. I hung up before he could respond. Scott bombarded me with calls and messages, each one dripping with apologies. If you're sorry, I retorted, pushing him away, just transfer the money. I knew my childhood home was gone forever, but this was the only way I could cope with the unbearable pain. I sought refuge at Judy's place. My brother's family and my children were aware of the situation. Although my brother must have been furious about our house being demolished without his consent, he said, 
I won't interfere, but I'll help in any way I can. Do what you think is best, Amy. Everyone condemned Scott's actions and rallied around me. A month passed without any compensation or even a partial payment from Scott. During that time, there was no contact from him whatsoever. I couldn't stay with Judy indefinitely. I needed the money as soon as possible just to establish a foundation for myself. Fueled by anger and a desperate need for resolution, something unbelievable happened. It was Judy who brought it to light. This apron looks a lot like Grandma's, she said, showing me her smartphone screen. I was stunned. It was a listing on a flea market app. The apron Judy mentioned, a unique one I had made for my mother, was strikingly similar. What? This is Grandma's apron. I made it, so I'm sure, I said, my voice trembling with a mix of disbelief and anger. Judy quickly scrolled through other listings. The seller seemed to have recently joined the app with no transactions or reviews. There were nearly 50 items listed, and to my horror, all of them belonged to my mother. I immediately realized it was Scott. He was the only one who could have taken my mother's belongings after demolishing the house. Scott, I said, my voice shaking with rage. What's this about the app? App? Scott responded, feigning ignorance. Don't play dumb. You're selling mom's things without permission, aren't you? Cancel those listings right now, I demanded. Scott, sounding panicked, replied, What? No, it wasn't me. Who else would do such a thing? I'm coming over right now to get everything back, I said, hanging up before he could utter another word. Then, with Judy by my side, I headed straight to Scott's parents' house. Where are mom's things? I demanded the moment we arrived, confronting Scott at the door. I, I don't know anything about it, he stammered, his eyes darting nervously. Tell the truth, Dad. Judy joined me, her voice firm. Scott seemed flustered, his face pale. His parents noticed our presence and came out. Oh, Judy, you're here, Scott's mom greeted, a forced smile plastered on her face. Angry, Judy said, Grandma, tell Dad to tell the truth. The truth? Grandma's belongings that passed away recently? Dad seems to be selling them, Judy stated, her voice laced with accusation. At Judy's words, Scott's mother burst into laughter, a chilling sound that sent shivers down my spine. Scott, his face etched with a troubled expression, kept repeating, it really wasn't me. Then his mother loudly exclaimed, Scott is selling them. That's impossible. I am the one selling them. My blood ran cold. Scott probably knew about it. The look he gave his mother, a look that almost screamed, this is bad, confirmed my suspicions. Despite Judy's shock, his mother cheerfully continued, what? It's a lot of work, you know. I have to pack everything carefully and make sure the photos look good. She seemed oblivious to the fact that she was selling stolen goods, chatting happily about the app as if it were a harmless hobby. I struggled to restrain myself from lunging at her, my anger threatening to boil over. Cancel the listings, Judy pleaded with her grandmother, her voice trembling with anger and tears. Those are yours to sell. However, Scott's mother seemed displeased. What's the big deal? She retorted nonchalantly. I finally found a hobby I enjoy. I use the things I can and sell the rest for a little pocket money. It's good for preventing dementia. I'm the only grandma left. So Judy wants me to stay healthy and live long, right? Starting with her to stop had no effect. There was no sign of remorse, only a disturbing sense of entitlement. If talking won't help, I said, my voice cold and resolute, then action is the only option. I pulled Judy out of the house, leaving Scott's mother to her delusional world. But it's okay, let's go, I insisted, heading straight to the police station. I wasn't planning to file a report for the demolition of the house, but theft was a different story. When I explained to the police that my mother's belongings were being stolen and sold, they acted immediately. Scott's mother's account on the flea market app was suspended. The items wouldn't be sold anymore. On the way back from the station, I called Scott. I had your mother's account stopped, I said, my voice laced with controlled fury. You knew about it, right? You're complicit. No, I... I filed a police report about this. Please cooperate with the investigation, Scott stammered, his voice frantic. But we're family, right? He pleaded. Withdraw it, please. Family, I scoffed. 
You still haven't paid any compensation for the house or alimony, and there's no sign of remorse. Faced with my shouting, Scott was taken aback. Despite everything, I still had feelings for Scott, having lived with him for so long. I'll wait for the money, I said, my voice softening slightly. But I won't forgive the theft. Return everything. As I spoke, I thought of Scott's father, whom I had just seen. He looked alarmingly thin and hadn't spoken much. His complexion was more than just pale. It was unnaturally dark. His ill health was obvious, but that family probably hadn't noticed. His wife was nonchalantly selling stolen items, and Scott only acted tough with me. They lacked any real concern for others. The next day, I received a call from Scott's father. Expecting it to be a thank you call, I answered, bracing myself. I got the complete opposite reaction. What do you mean by treating me like a sick person, planning to dump me in a hospital to get rid of the hassle? He snarled. I need to protect Scott and my wife from you. I'm not going to any hospital. It was shocking to be reprimanded when I was just concerned. Sorry for overstepping, I said, my voice carefully neutral. I was just worried. Humph. I'm not frail or short-lived like your parents. Don't make a fool of me, he snapped. I was infuriated by his words, but a few days later, he apparently felt unwell enough to visit the hospital. The diagnosis was terminal cancer. Scott called me in a panic. Dad's got terminal cancer. What am I going to do? I snorted, my voice laced with disbelief. I don't know. What did he say when I suggested going to the hospital? He said, I'm not frail or short-lived like your parents, so deal with it yourself. Scott replied, his voice cracking with emotion. How can you be so heartless, Amy? I never thought you'd be such a person. Did you ever say a single warm word when my mother was sick? After his funeral, his will was found. Despite all his talk of not being short-lived, he had made thorough preparations. The house goes to the grandson, Eric. The rest of the estate is to be divided between my wife and my eldest son. I was surprised to see Eric's name. Scott's father had always favored him, wanting to live with him. He must have wanted Eric to have the house even after his death. It was news to Eric as well. Renounce the inheritance, I told Eric. You don't need that house. But he was happy to receive it. Inheriting the house was more of a burden than a benefit due to inheritance tax, but if he was pleased, I had no right to say anything. Following the will, Eric inherited the house. His grandmother was happy and paid the inheritance tax. He's our successor, after all, she said. While that's not wrong, I felt a bit sad as if Eric had been taken from me. Then something unbelievable happened next. Come over to our house, Scott's call prompted me to head straight to his parents' house. When I arrived, I saw Scott's mother and Scott himself standing in front of their house, stunned. Just like I once had been, the site was filled with heavy machinery and trucks labeled with demolition company names. Workers were tearing down their house right before our eyes. What's going on? I asked, my voice trembling with a mix of shock and disbelief. It's my house. I can do what I want with it, Eric said, appearing from somewhere, looking satisfied as he watched the demolition. Eric, what are you doing? Stop this right now, Scott shouted, his voice filled with panic. Stopping it now won't make it livable anyway, Eric replied, his voice cold and detached. What have you done? Scott's mother and Scott were begging Eric, but Eric just laughed. Did you forget what Grandpa and Dad did to Mom? Grandma, you were awful to Mom too, right? Did you apologize? Eric's smile turned into a sharp glare at Scott's mother. They fell to their knees as the heavy machinery continued to noisily dismantle their house. I finally felt relieved seeing this scene. Later, Scott finally paid the damages and compensation from the inherited assets. The stolen items that Scott's mother took from my mother were retrieved by Eric and safely returned to me. You always have me and Judy, Eric said, and I finally shed tears of relief. Scott's mother and Scott, having lost their house and left with no money, were now living in a company house again. Scott and I had moved out of the company house, but now Scott and his mother had to return, becoming the subject of rumors. I explained the whole truth to Scott's colleague's wife, who we were on good terms with. Scott and his mother will likely have a hard life in the company housing, but it's their own doing. After Scott's retirement, they'll be forced to save up for a new place to live. I sometimes think about asking my friend, who lives in the house Scott and his mother are living now, 
just to have something to talk about. After that, I continued to stay at Judy's house. Then Eric got engaged to be married. He was planning to build a house. The land of the former family home sold for a decent amount, and I was glad to see that even that house served a purpose. Mom, come live with us, Eric offered. His fiance welcomed me warmly. Since I couldn't keep relying on Judy, who lived alone indefinitely, I decided to take Eric up on his offer. I am thinking of living happily with my new family, determined not to become a mother-in-law like my own mother-in-law. <laughs>